All right, so let's start. Um, welcome again. So today we have two visitors, some up for a teaching award, so act like you like this class. Right? Um, and you'll be asked you know, for feedback at some point. You know, be, be, be honest and talk to them. Yeah. Um, any questions before we start? All right, today we're talking, we're talking the first two weeks on tree inference. Right? And much of the class is about you know, using tree. So we all hear mostly because you want to use the trees to understand cool biology, right? Um, first, you have to get them. And last week, we talked about how to, how to get them by stealing them from other people, right? And so we're talking about how to make them yourselves. Um, and so I had you read some of the key papers here, right? So we're giving an overview of the field. And of course, you know, there's lots of papers about, the, about this in the field. There's lots of fighting about this in the field. So today, what we're going to do is talk about some of these papers and then go on to actually having you make your own trees, okay? And you know, having you go through these existing tutorials and pick which one you want to use, and pick you know which philosophy you have. Okay. So any questions about that? All right. So the first thing we want to start with is the Lewis paper. All right. So Paul Lewis is this really good at explaining of it. All right. So what is the point of his paper? So, and what's the most commonly used model before, like, you know, this people did, was it describing a change, not making a change, right? So, I think, a lot of people using parsimony, right? So, how does parsimony work? Yep. Do you agree with that? We're going, to do, we're going to do exercises later on in the Tartan Okay. So, you, so first one, you have to do the best tree has the fewest changes, right? Like Sarah said. Do you agree with that? Pretty safe bet. Pretty safe bet. Okay, so why do all this new stuff? Everything is simple. Okay, so why? Why? So good. So what can be the case where the simple model doesn't work though? Um, when there's like gene transfer between two things and they're not actually individual species, but rather something that we infringe between them at the end of the result. Yep. So we have like particular evolution, yeah. right? We have gene flow between populations, right? So like oak trees, right? Okay, you're gonna go out and identify. This is a red oak. This is a white oak, right? But in reality, they're passing genes all around. And so you have this mismatch of what the species are, right? And so making a phylogeny for those would be hard, right? Because you know most of the genes are coming this way, but some genes are coming from this other species, right? So we need methods to deal with that. Good. What else? What else might you like or not like parsimony? The best clue is apomorphies. Best clue is apomorphies. Okay, that's jargon. What's apomorphies? Um, it's a character that only like one species on the tree has. Right, so, so, so odd apomorphy, right? So, oh, yeah. yep. So we have our phylogeny, right? So we have some trait here that only that species has, right? So what's an example of an apomorphy? Trees have lots of kneecaps. Walking kneecaps, awesome, right? So <laughs> explain that. I think I know what you mean, but. So you know, I'm not using I'm not using any muscles right now to keep from falling over. Right? Okay. So I mentioned I would think cow, cattle would have that too. It's like things like sleep standing up. You know, does like any form of relevant to other great apes or is it? What else? 
issues with moving on and not making more long-term differences in the probabilities. That was, yep. Yeah. Right. So the Elsenstein the, the yeah. paper, you know, perhaps might be positively misleading because it's not consistent. Right. Yeah. right. So what does consistent mean there? They define it as as you get more data, you don't converge on the expected answer. So right. you ex think it's a consistent. The more data you get, the closer you get to the true answer, and that's not the case. Right. So then we try to estimate. You know, what's the effect of smoking on life? Right. I measure three people and I get an estimate, like, oh, it increases your lifespan by 10%. And I measure like 40 people, now I measure 1,000 people, now I measure a million people, we get a better, better estimate of the, the death rate from smoking versus not smoking, right? And when things that are consistent, as you, as, as you measure more and more and more and more data points, you converge on the right answer, right? With parsimony in some cases, as you measure more and more, more data points, you converge with higher and higher confidence on the wrong answer. Why would that be a problem? Whatever. You don't want to get the wrong answer. You don't want to get the wrong answer, right? However, people argue it's not a problem because you have a finite amount of data, right? So how how your method works when you have an infinite amount of data? That's nice to know about. This sort of an academic exercise, right? But if I only, all I have is a thousand characters, they don't care what consistency like. They just care about with a thousand characters, what gives me the best answer. And that's sort of a fight. Most, most people in the field think that consistency matters. Right? This minority thing together. I've had this fight for a while. Um, good. And so where, where do we have this inconsistency? You know, where, where does parsimony fail? What kind of trees or what kind of data does it fail? For that? I mean, these thousand, so the thousand paper has an example of this, right? But in the field in general, we have this thing we call long branch attraction. You've heard of that before, right? It's kind of cool fear, right? What does it mean? Cool, okay. So, let's take the Felsen sign paper. Right? Here's the tree, Felsen's paper. Make sure yeah, he did. Oh, he, so he drew it a different way, right? Well, well so I'll oh, draw it this way. Right? And we have A, B, C, and the root. Right? So with the consistency, what happens? How does the tree get messed up? What's, what's the wrong tree you get according to that the paper? Right. Right. So talk, talk to each other. Like we can go back and spin the paper again. So it has a lot of math right, in the paper. What do folks think? Difficulty of that. This way, um, it makes two long branches for people more probable than much shorter mm -hmm. change. Right. <laughs> yeah. So what? It, basically, you're right. So it makes it such that having a change here and a change here is more likely 
then a change here. A change here, right? And so a change here tells me that A and B are grouped, right? Just common ancestry because A and B share this trait. It's a synape morphy. Right? Um, changing here and here, right, means that A got this trait and C got this trait, right? But not from shared ancestry. They evolved it twice. Okay? So these brains get long enough. You know, there's more and more changes here than here. So now this brain gets really tiny, these brains get really long, we start seeing more homoplasing. Right? The same trait is more, more than once. Okay? And so for parsimony, parsimony wants to have minimizing the amount of changes. Right? So it'll say, oh, A and C are together, so that way the purple trait evolves just once. Right? And that's what happens. And so that's why you see in your paper, you have this region where depending on the branch lengths, you have more likely to get this evolving twice, this evolving once. Okay. And now we call that, in his honor, the Felsenstein zone. Um, <coughs> this area where, according to, your, according to your true branch lengths, you're more likely to get the wrong answer than the right answer with parsimony. Okay. Or with neighbor Jordan, which is a distance measure that people don't use and you should not use. Okay. <coughs> and that's this long range attraction thing where A and C come together because it's both of these one branch that's homoplasing. And likelihood and Bayesian methods that have models are supposed to escape this area because if we have the right model, it has information from the otate morphies um, that, you know, other information that says that, you know, we have a bunch of changes on this branch, a bunch of changes on this branch, that suggests that those branches are long for other reasons. So that's more, so that likelihood knows that it's likely to have two changes here than one change there. Okay. So we can turn off the sound. No, it's needed. I'm not sure what that noise is. Sorry. Yeah. Can you explain the conclusion that says um, that parsimony methods are they fail to be consistent with parallelism? Parallelism is accepted. Is that the same yes. process as this? Yes. Yeah, so parallel evolution of these two traits. Oh. So okay. Okay. And so that's in this. And so we'll look, look at this in different contexts. One question is if branching is proportional to time, right? Can this happen? Yes, it can. There's cases like that. Okay. Um, still have the idea of we call breaking up long branches, where if here's my fir tree, and I know there's other species here that probably connect to C, if I can, you know, sample those species, you know, D, E, maybe species over here, F, I break up these long branches. I can better detect that they have two changes versus one change. Okay, and that's one way to try to escape it. The other way is to try to use a better net model. Okay, so we'll use language models. So questions about that? Okay, so here we have a case where parsimony can be misleading, right? But on the other hand, parsimony is simple, right? Just minimizing the changes, right? So in the field, you know, people who use morphological data often will still use parsimony, right? So the paleontologists in the class, you know, your advisor uses parsimony, you know, use parsimony, right? Um, but likely models are shown to work better. And actually, one really cool thing about, about parsimony is that can you, actually, you can make a likelihood model to give the same results as parsimony. So if you have a model that has a different rate of evolution of every character and every branch, that's the same as parsimony. So it gives you the same branch lengths and everything. It's kind of cool to compare parsimony models to likelihood models just by making it. It's a very complex, it's a very primitive rich model, so you won't choose it. You can, you can incorporate it. Right, any questions so far? So Lewis talks about parsimony, there's also neighbor joining, which we're not going to get into, and distance measures, right? Um, <coughs> and then likelihood models, right? So what are likelihood models about? What's, what's likelihood? How likely a certain scenario is going to happen? Right, so the general, you know, English word is how, how likely, how probable something is going to happen, right? How likely is it that you know someone will win an election, or that you know they win the lottery, or something like that, right? Um, <coughs> and statistics, like, is a more precise meaning. So the probability of the hypothesis, of the, the data giving your hypothesis, 
right? And so there's actually the video linked um, on the course website here that you can look at for more detail on this, right? <coughs> but example is, you know, coin flipping. I get three heads in a row, right? What's the probability of that? Well, the probability if my coin has only heads on it, the probability is that that's one, right? If the coin is a biased coin, so I have, you know, two-thirds chance of tails, Right, the probability of that is one third times one third times one third. It's pretty unlikely, right? And so that's all likelihood is. Okay. And in this context, what we do is we have a model for evolution, and then we <coughs> um, maximize. We, we we look at how we how we figure out the probability of the data given the given that model, and try changing parameters of that model. Okay. And so Lewis talked about that a bit right, in different kinds of models. And one thing we have we have now is flowering of models, right? We have very simple models. We just have you know zero, one, game loss of some trait, and all at the same rate everywhere. We have a lot of models that have you know DNA evolution. We have you know certain, certain substitutions are more likely than others. We have codon models. So we saw all those models in the paper. Okay. Um, for for paleontology now we have models that deal with biased data sets, because right? because people who work in morphology go out and measure all the major things that are variable. Right? So if I try to try to do a phylogeny of great apes, right? But I say, you know, it has eyes. Well, yeah, all great apes have eyes. So I'm not going to score that. It has bones. Yeah. So that information is not going to help me for a phylogeny, typically. Right? Now, with likelihood, it does, right? Because this is information about these rates of evolution. Okay. Um, but most of the don't have that. And so there's a way to deal with that using what we call the Lewis NKV model, right? which is a very simple likelihood model that deals with that sort of bias. So you know, there's always ways you can dig down to lots of detail. What I'm trying to do is just to expose you to ideas here, so you can dig into it. So give a look, go and look, look for data sets for your, for, your, for your path of interest, right? So what do you have for your data sets? What kind of data do you have? What kind of model do you think is appropriate for them? Yeah. Cedric. Okay, and what data have you been running? Are you running the HIV data, or? Uh, no, I'm, I was running, I tried to estimate the pH of introgression mm -hmm. into an organism, and um, my estimated age uh, lies around the age of a fungi kingdom, which I find oh, cool. unreasonable, that yeah. was fun. <laughs> um, and what kind of data are you using? Morphology, or? Uh, and I'm, uh, as I'm using, uh, Rates of mutation. Mm -hmm. the difference in rate of mutation. Yep. And what are you making the tree out of if you're making the tree? I used a tree from the um, okay. So you didn't well, learn last week, you, I you stole it. And right. then I used Rasmus to build it again okay. um, under different models to see if um, there's a difference um, um, based on. Well, I was interested in the placement of. Organisms with the introgression changes if I use the introgressed region versus with the rest of the genome. Right. And um, so, yeah. so just put it in context. So, so I was looking at these yeasts, right? And one of these yeasts, a part of this chromosome, has a chunk of DNA from somewhere else, right? And like, where does this chunk come from? That's his question, right? And so to do that, you you know infer the phylogeny. You got a, well, I mean, better you stole a phylogeny like we talked about last week, but you also tried making your own, right? Using sequence data, yeah. right? So using DNA data. So what kind of model do you use? Um, I use um, GTR maybe or I use WAG um, for okay. Uh, yeah. And I tried others, but I don't have to listen to Yeah, yeah. So there's models for DNA, there's models for amino acids, there's models for codons, right? And so if you chose a, a uh, amino acid model, right? Is that a good model? I tested the nucleotide model, I tested amino acid models, and I observed that amino acid models don't give me any difference mm -hmm. in topology, while the nucleotide models give me only slight variation in mm -hmm. topology. And um, yeah, then I tried to use my rate of mutation to estimate a branch length, a potential branch length, to try to figure out how old that integration might be. And at this point, that 
Yeah, that's right. So, cool. So, right, so that means so he has this nucleotide identity. You can analyze it multiple ways, right? So you can treat it as A, T, Gs, and Cs, right? Or you can treat it as codons, because it comes from triplet, it codes for amino acids, right? They're triplet code. So A, T, G, you know, codes as A, T, C. Or you can code it as amino acids, right? Now, can you do it for all DNA data? No, why not? So you can go ribosomal gene, ri ri ribosomal um, RNA, right? So your ribosome is this machine, right? And part of it's made out of protein, part of it's made out of just RNA, right? The whole RNA world thing, you know, for those who took my class, the macroevolution class, right? Um, and those aren't protein coding genes. Those are just raw RNAs floating that do stuff, right? And so you don't have a codon structure. So, you know, so you cannot convert that to codons. Okay. So part of being able to use these models is figuring out what your data actually gonna what kind of data, data sets do people have? Morphological. Morphological, right? And so, how how do you, what, what kind of morphological data do you have? Uh, I have morphological data from major chain transfers, so like primary leader chains uh, and secondary leader chains, and then the rest. Mm -hmm. And are those data so are those represented as zeros and ones, or zero ones and twos, or mostly zeros and ones, but some twos and threes. Okay. Why does that matter? Why do I ask? Why did I ask Sarah that? I think about the models we have, right? So we have models for transition between states, right? So that could go to the Lewis paper and you see on um, Figure Two, right? We have a oh, box two. Sorry, we have. These different models for transitions, right? And so you can have a model going from you know zero to one, where you have you know the rate of going from zero to one is A, the rate of going from one to zero is B, right? Now if I have state two, is this the same as A or is it C or is it D, right? And so you can imagine having these different kinds of models, these different kinds of models, these different complexities, right? And so you can assume any change has equal probability, or you can assume that some genes have more likely than others, right? So, what would be example of a change that's more likely than others for a morphological data set? Okay, think about eyes, right? So, you can score things on presence or absence of eyes, right? Which rate's probably more, more high, higher? Gaining eyes or losing eyes? Gaining eyes. Okay, why do you say gaining eyes? Uh, it's from the seed, and it's a rare situation that that becomes less and less rare. Okay. Yeah. So eyes is this cool trait, right? And so you imagine we've seen eyes evolve in, you know, insects. We've seen eyes evolve in vertebrates. We've seen actually the example of eyes forming in chitons now, right? Because they can see through their shell. Right? So there are a few examples of that, right? So that's one argument for it. So natural selection leads to eyes. Are there, is not, is, uh, does everyone believe that, or is it different? Yeah. Well, it's easier to lose your sight than it is to lose sight Okay. Um, right. So uh, you can imagine losing eyes, right? So we have cave fish and salamanders and stuff that have lost eyes because you don't need them anymore, and they cost energy to produce. And so those that don't produce eyes do better, right? So we have disagreement. How can you solve that? Twitter store. Run for logic and then do what with it? Yeah. Exactly. Right. So these models we have of you know the rate of B going from one to zero, rate of A going going from zero to one, you can in your model, Lewis talks about this, you can try setting them as equal, right? You can then try them as A bigger than B or B bigger than A. And see which which model fits best, right? So if you, so rather than just using the using these to get the phylogeny, you can use this the phylogeny to actually infer something about these models. And we're going to talk about that more in two weeks, right? It's kind of cool how the models we use for building the trees can also then be used to understand cool things about biology. And there's all this sort of continuous model space where you can flip in how you use them. That's pretty cool. And one other nice thing about it, and you get this a little bit from the Lewis paper. We'll talk about this more in the future. Is a lot of these models are pretty similar, right? 
So the model we used for DNA, it didn't say what was the model we used for morphology, it was the model as, as you use for codons. Um, they're all basically the same thing, we're just relabeling what's in, the, what's in these, these axes. Okay, so once you understand one, you understand many of them. Okay, good. So any other questions about uh, model choice or inference? We'll get more into model choice later, we're talking about AIC and phase factors and things like that. That comes up a little bit in the, in the Beast paper too. So what about this base thing that this talks about? What is Bayes' rule? Okay, so one, th one thing we do, and this is in the video, we can talk about it here. If I flipped a coin three times and got two heads and a tail, is that I'm going to flip it 18 no more times, right? And if you, get the, if you get the right number of heads, I'll give you 10 bucks, right? What would you guess for the right, right, right number of heads? <laughs> Jasper, what would you choose? Regular coin, like penny, you know, actual coin. I flip it 18 times. How many heads am I going to get? You, you, you go for what? Well, how, how many heads will I get? Out of 18 flips, how many heads will I get on a, on a coin? Nine. nine. You guess nine, right? Have you agree with him on about nine? Right? That's a very bad answer. Because think about life of it, I flipped a coin three times already and got two heads and a tail, right? So your estimate is two thirds chance of heads, right? Based on the coin flipping. And so you think using likelihood, the, the way the data is most probable with coin flipping at this point is two thirds heads, of course. So that's why if you're using likelihood, you would say two thirds, and so two thirds of 18 would be your answer for, for, for 12, right? For the number of heads, right? But that feels wrong to everyone in the room, right? Because we know something about coins, right? We know they're typically fair, right? Or if they're not fair, it's, you know, 0.5001 or something, right? <coughs> and so you're using that other information, you bring that in to your estimate, right? That's what Bayes' rule lets you do. Okay, so likely just takes your model and takes the data and fig figures out what best, how you best predict your data using your model, right? Bayes' rule takes that, but also takes the other information. Other information is what you call your prior information. Okay, so the Bayes rule is the probability of a hypothesis given your data. So this slash here means given equals probability of your of your data given your hypothesis times probability of the hypothesis over that for all hypotheses. Right? So I'm packing this a little bit. So probability of the hypothesis given the data, that's cool, right? So we're saying, you know, I have a hypothesis the coin's fair, right? This comes out and says, probability of you being right is 20%, right? Probability that, you know, someone be elected president, right? You turn your model, it says probability that person be elected president is 45%, okay? That's a number you understand and can use, right? But the likelihood, probably to get, get, get a given the hypothesis. So the probability that, you know, someone's polling at 45% in Ohio, given that they're gonna be president, is this. Which is fine, but it's not quite what you want, want this. So likelihood and the posterior probability is what they call this. Um, and this is your prior probability of the hypothesis, right? So absent data, what do you think is going to be? Right, so with coin flipping, Jasper knows coins are fair, right? So even though likelihood says, <coughs> you know, the you maximize the probability of getting two out of three heads, if the probability of getting heads is two-thirds, as likelihood says, 
right? Your prior says, yeah, but I know something about how coins are. They're probably fair. So you put that into there as your prior, prior probability. Okay. And this denominator is just doing that across all your hypotheses. Right? So we do this something where we say, okay, hypothesis is one, hypothesis is two, hypothesis is three, do the same thing for everybody. Okay? And so together, together we use the posterior. Right? That makes sense? Okay. And this is Bayes' rule. This is not controversial. This is just math. Right? You can give it, derive it by doing you know, Venn diagrams and the area here and the area here and the area here. You can do it with just basic probability theory. Right? You're not going to do that here. It works. If you don't believe it, go home and try it out. Okay? So that's not controversial. But there's still a big fight about using it. What might be the fight about? Lewis gets into this a little bit. How you assign your priors, right? So, you know, Jasper thinks my coin's fair, right? I'm doing this DAS class, maybe, maybe I only have unfair coins, right? Because I'm mean, right? And so <coughs> then your prior would not be for it being fair, right? Um, if we're doing priors for, you know, our eyes are more likely to evolve or more likely to be lost, right? So I can come in with just likelihood and say, okay, look, let my data drive me. Or I can say, you know what? Eyes are really complex. They're going to be lost more. So I'll put a strong prior on them being lost. Or I can say, eyes are awesome. You know, they help you survive more, so we'll have a high prior on eyes being gained. And the answer you get out will differ depending on those priors going in. And so this can create an issue, right? And so <coughs> there are two kinds of issues here. One is if you use priors at all. And one is if you do use priors, which priors do you use? OK. Um, now, in practice, in the field, and we'll see when we get to the exercise later today, when you're doing Bayesian stuff, most people don't have strong priors going in. Right? I said to you, what's the rate of, uh, what's the rate of going from A's to T's in DNA? I'm going to say, 1% per million years. I think it's 2% per million years. You don't care. You don't know. Right? And so what we do here is often use what we call flat priors. Which are flat, flat priors are uninformative. Right? So in the coin flipping example, you know, what's the probability of getting heads? I'd say I have a coin. What's the probability of getting heads with it? You could say, it's, it's going to be 0.5. It's so really tight on 0.5. Or you could say, I have no idea. It could be 0.1, it could be 0.9, it could be 0.5. What's the probability? Right? It's a flat prior. And so you can argue about what those, you know, so that you can do this prior that doesn't affect things much. And that's, that's what people often do. Okay. Now there aren't always priors like that. So when you start using beast, this is a prior for branch lengths. Right? And then you based on what we call the Yule prior, which means which is a model where you have speciation and no extinction. Right? And that's nice because it's very simple, right? It's one rate. Okay? The bad thing about that is the only thing we know really about evolution is that stuff goes extinct. Right. Everything else we, we, you know, we have good evidence for, but extinction, you know, there's no T-Rex outside. Right? So we know extinction's there. So you can use a different prior that has birth and death. Right? But the results you get out might, might differ. Okay? And that's one of the issues with um, using, like, using bug behavior versus Bayesian approaches. Okay? Now, in practice in the field, people sort of use both, and people aren't that committed. But it can matter in certain things. Now, the goal is that as you add more and more data, the prior matters less. Right, so if I had a coin that was really unfair, I flipped the coin four times, my prior still matters. Right? The fact that I think it's fair, my prior still overwhelms the likelihood. If I flip it a thousand times, and I get heads a thousand times, I'm pretty sure then the coin's not fair. Right? And so the hope is that as you get more data, you can reject it. You start ignoring the priors much more. All right, so any questions about that? OK. Um, now, finally, the other thing we had in the reading was, how do you know if you're right? right? So you can use parsimony, you can use, like, you can use Bayes, you get a tree. You say, ah, this is the tree. Right? I don't think, it's, I don't think you're right. right? How, do you, how do you prove that your tree is good? So in the papers you read, what, what do people do? Bootstrap. Bootstrap. Right? So what's bootstrap? From your character data that either includes a character, doesn't include a character, includes a character multiple times, but it's essentially essentially resample out of your, your data set mm -hmm. um, right. to find supported values for your tree. Right. And why is it called bootstrapping? Um, 
It's an old expression, picking yourself up by your own bootstraps, right? Just one boots today, right? So you're on the ground, so you're lifting yourself up, using your own, just stuff you have yourself, right? So it's bootstrapping, trying to get confidence, but you can't go out and like, so one way to get confidence is you go out and get new data. You say, okay, this is my aspect using these genes, then you go out and measure these other genes and see if I get the same answer. That'd be awesome, right? But then why just use them in the first place, right? So what bootstrapping does is say, let me estimate confidence using only what I have already. It sounds crazy, right? Um, but it actually works. And this, and I mean, the original bootstrapping paper. There's now some minor methodological changes people do and stuff. But it's basic, basic idea, right? So <coughs> as you was saying, what you do is you sample your data again. So we have a data matrix: A T C, A T G, A A A, for example, right? What you do is sample with replacement. Okay. What does that mean? So if you pulled out like that middle A or something, yep. you could pull it out again. You wouldn't have to lose it. Exactly. So you go and okay, pull that one out. That's sample one. And now I can pull it out again if I happen to. right? Um, now what's the other thing without replacement? What would happen then? I get the same. Right, so I get the same data set. I would say, okay, well, now this is gone, so near. What was going to come next? Uh, oh, that one, right? And I might get different order, right, with the same characters. Okay, so then using the methods we talked about so far, we get the same tree or different tree? We just reorder the characters. Okay, talk to, talk to each other about this then. Is reorder the data matrix so we get the same tree or different tree? All right, ready? So one finger for same, two finger for different. Commit, commit. Yes. So <laughs> if you could get, get the same phylogeny with this reordering, one, you're gonna get. A you could get if you think you could get a different phylogeny with reordering two. So sampling without replacement. What do you think can happen? So go vote. Good, so mixture of people. Okay, so argue for your side. Those who think two, explain why. So, and that could depend on your tree algorithm, right? So, one algorithm we could use is so AT, so let's just do a two character, right? Versus AT, G, AT, C, right? So, one, two, two, one. Right. And you can imagine a tree building algorithm where you work the first character first and build a tree, and then add the second character, build a tree, um, and then start doing tree swapping, right? Or branch swapping. Um, in that case, okay, so the order could sort of depend there. Would the, would the overall best tree differ though? No, right? So if we calculate the, the parsimony score. Right, we say, how many changes does this character need? How many changes does this character need? Right? 
between likelihood with the probability of these characters times with the probability of these characters, right? If I swap those, you know, plus plus, addition is commutative, right? So I can say, you know, one plus two is the same as two plus one, right? With likelihood, it's probabilities, so it's, you know, probably this times probability of this. And so it's also commutative, right? And so just swapping, in theory, should give me the same tree. How can you test that? So you just do it perfectly, right? Exactly. What else can you do to show it? We make the Feldenstein paper, right? Where he just does some simple equations and then shows, okay, this is the likelihood with this, this is the likelihood with this. Right? So we do the same thing and show that the likelihood's the same no matter which way you order it. Right? So Right, so in general, this should be, if you just re reorder, it shouldn't affect the, the confidence. It shouldn't affect the tree you get out. Okay. Now, again, so if you watch one of the, vi the video you watched this week, tree space is large, right? It's NP hard. Which is, what does that mean? NP nasty, is something they call it in computer science. Right, so, it's, so finding the best tree is a very, very difficult problem, right? So for you know, 50 taxa, there are more possible trees than there are atoms in the universe, right? So if you try to look, search thoroughly, and like try to look at this tree, and look at this tree, and look at this tree, you know, that's a lot of tree space to go through, okay? And it's, it's a cool problem, though, because you can say, I think you know, this tree, the best tree, has a, has a parsimony score of five. You can verify that parsimony score very quickly. You can't show me there's a tree that has length four very easily. So this, Interesting class of computer problems. Okay, um, so and there's no exact solution, right? So you can do these search algorithms. So in practice, you can have this swapped and just because you don't happen to get the same answer because, because the search is hard, you might get different answers, right? But in theory, if you can search well enough, you should get the same answer for the beats. Okay, so with bootstrapping, we don't get the same answer. Right? Why is that? So if here's my original data, right? I, I, for example, can get three different things out. Right? I could get out the same thing. Or what else could I get out? If I'm, if I'm doing bootstrapping. What? Right. So I could get A, T, C, and by chance also get A, T, C again. Or I could get a, T, G, A, T, G again, right? Or I can get this in the reverse order, right? And so <coughs> those are different data sets, right? Um, and so with bootstrapping, what you do is you, as, as you sample, you get these new data sets and you do the, your same analysis again. Okay, so it's very expensive, right? So back in the old days, you'd have a tree of 500 species on it, and people would run it for two months to get the best tree. So this famous Zilla data, data set after Godzilla. You like run for months on their computer, like, don't unplug it, careful, right? And then you get, the, get, the, get the best tree, and then someone else comes up with a new algorithm and say, oh, I found the better tree in only two weeks, yay, right? And so with bootstrapping, what you do is you do that with your original data, you make up this new data, and do it again, and again, and again, 100 times, 200 times to get this estimate, right? So it's really costly in terms of time, right? Um, <coughs> but that's, that's how we do it. With likelihood, we do the same thing, where we get the data out again, make up new data sets, and reanalyze them a couple of times. Okay. Now, in practice, now people cheat, right? So people are using, we'll talk about RaxML later today, right? It's like the search program, and that has this sort of cheating algorithm where you can get your original tree, and then just when you get new trees, it, 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 in, internally doesn't quite recover the likelihood each time. So it's an approximation. So you just sort of bootstrap-ish estimates. You get uncertainty, but with some fuzziness. Now, that, that's what you do with, with parsimony and likelihood, right? What about with Bayesian stuff? So the Drummond paper, right, about Beast. How do they get uncertainty? Mm 
This also talks about, talked about in the Lewis paper, that sort of plot of the, the contour plot. What are they talking about? Can they get estimate uncertainty? They can use the small blockchain Monte Carlo demo they said at least to get uncertainty for the time data. Yep, and you can do it for all your, for your topology too, right? So Markov chain Monte Carlo, right? That's clear, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so what's Markov chain? So it's a mathematical process that has some properties, right? It's memoryless. If I was joking with my students, I'm memoryless. I'm a Markov process. I don't remember things well, right? And basically, where you go next depends on only where you are, right? So if I were a gas particle, we wouldn't be on the room, right? So at any point, I have a velocity and a position, right? Where I go next depends on just that, my current velocity and position. It depends on whether I came in this way or that way, right? But then like my house price, you know, when I resell my house, I care about what it sold for in the past. Right, not what its current value is. I don't want to lose money on it. Because that's non Markovian, because it's memory. Okay? So the whole class of problems like this that are called Markov, Markov processes. Okay? Monte Carlo just means Vegas style. Right? So Monte Carlo is a famous gambling place in Europe. Right? Um, so back when this was being developed, you know, people would say call it that, but just now it's a Vegas. Right? Basically, what it is just any sort of randomization process. Okay? <coughs> so Markov chain in Monte Carlo is a process where we sort of move around this space. Randomly, okay, with some probabilities. And so what we're doing is using it as an estimate of certainty. And it's a very, very cool process. So the example I always use is if you're looking to do a hat, like trying to figure out what kind of hats you like. Okay? And so one thing you could do is you could say, okay, let's have all these cowboy hats versus baseball hats versus other things. Let's have red versus green versus blue, right? And you should say, okay, what's your actual, how much do you like red and cowboy hat? How much do you like blue and beanie? And all those combinations, right? It might be hard to do. This Markov chain Monte Carlo approach, what you do is sort of wander around with a hat on your head. Then as you get to come to a new, new hat, you say, if it's better, I put it on. That's the rule. If it's worse, then you have a probability of putting it on. You know how much worse it is. Right? So go over and find a pink cowboy hat and love it. Put it on. Right? Find a blue beanie, and it's okay, I'll put it on. Or I might not put it on with some probability. And if it's a you know green, you know, um, I don't know. Give me a hat type. Fedora, right? I might hate it, and I'll have very low probability of putting it on, right? If you have a security cam, watch a person go around putting on these hats. The amount of time they have a hat on their head is proportional to how much they like that hat, okay? And so that's why in that Lewis paper, you have this, you know, this scatter plot, right? And the more time it spends in this one area, the more it likes it, the higher the posterior probability, okay? And so <coughs> this cool algorithm where rather than having to do like, you know, optimize everything, then this thing would just move around at random, so Monte Carlo, right? And all that matters is where I am now, what's in front of me, Markov. Right? So Markov chain Monte Carlo gives me this estimate. Okay. What are problems with that? I think with the hat store example, right? So I walk in, have my hat, I'll try a new hat, am I done? No, why? So a lot of hats in the hat store, right? And so I have to try along a lot of hats to figure, figure out that probability density, right? So, and there are more trees than there are hats, right, in the world. And so looking over that tree space is a very, very big space to look at. Okay. What else could matter? If it's random and you have a lot of it, that's, you might not find the best tree, or you might only get the chance to look at that best tree for a little bit, because like you said, if there's one that's close to it, you might switch to it with a lower probability, but there's still a probability that will happen, and it might take a really long time to come back to the tree you like. Yep, exactly. So you might just, you know, that's what's way over here, the back, the back of the store, it takes a long time to get there, right? And so whenever you're doing these Bayesian approaches, the big question is, have you run it long enough, right? Do you search over well enough that you have a good chance of finding this best, best tree? What else could matter?
So the National Structure of Home is a, a arranged combatter, right? So if I like cowboy hats and I, re I really like um, a bowler, right? I have to go through this, this region of fedoras that I hate, right? It's like very hard for me to go across these fedoras, right? Like, it's like, oh, I don't like that, I don't like that. You have very little probably of crossing it. So eventually you get there, but it'll take you a long time, okay? But the same way here on the loose, loose paper, right? If I'm up here, I want to stable down here, but I have to go through this valley. And it's definitely a problem too. So, if you do, and the theory is, if you do it long enough, you'll get there. But there's ways to do shortcuts, right? So, some of the methods we're going to talk about today, they actually do um, MC cubed, and what they do with that is um, <coughs> multiple chain Markov chain one together, and um, that allows you to go across these values. Because what you're doing in the hat store analogy is you have your friend with the same same like like their dislikes of hats as you do, but it's slightly drunk. And so you might be more picky about which hat you put on. Your friend would be like, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. And so they can more easily cross these valleys. And fair enough, you say, how's your hat? You know, oh, mine's great. And so if, if you like them, you switch. Now you go to where your friend is. And so your friend can help you get across these valleys. Okay. And you can do something called temperature when you're doing these analyses. And the higher the temperature, the flatter the space, the drunker your friend. The more you do this for you to traverse this space. <coughs> So that's in Washington's method. So when you're running these, you know, you need to make sure that you search space well enough. Okay? And we have various diagnostics for this. Right? So in these, for example, you can figure out the effective sample size. Right? So if I say in one place you're just trying a few hats, you know, I've done you know, 50 flips, only been in one part of the store. There's only about effectively maybe five hats. Right? And so there's ways to estimate that using the yeast or red bait. Okay? So any questions about that? All right, so that's the basic intro to, to likelihood and Bayes and tree inference. Okay? And we'll come back on this later in the semester. We'll talk more about using these for diversification analyses and trait evolution. Okay, right now, it's just mostly about the tree, inferring the tree. Okay. Does everything seem clear there? Bayes, likelihood parsimony. Okay. So, what do you want to use for your data? I okay, have a data set here. Okay. So, do you want to use parsimony? Do you want to use likelihood? Do you want to use Bayes? Why? Sarah, because I know you're doing this already, right? So, what have you done in the past? Uh, on mixture or I run it for mixture and combination. Okay, and why both? Why those? Uh, in case of something like that, where you usually don't talk about parsimony and that come up, but you don't want to use like the same set. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's a good call, John. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. Right, and so it's something people do. So, you know, if you're philosophically pure, you would say, I believe in parsimony. There's people in their field who just, you know, I will only use parsimony because that's my philosophical beliefs. Karl Popper told me to use, pop use parsimony, right? Um, there's people who believe the same way with likelihood, right? I don't want priors, I just want likelihood. Or there are people that are with Bayesian, where I want to incorporate this prior information, so I'll only use this, right? So there are philosophically pure people like that. In general, people are like, yeah, I'll try both. And parsimony has problems with consistency. Likely has problems with models being too complex. If they give you the same answer, that's probably pretty, pretty good evidence. Okay, so that's one approach to it. But the downside of that is you get it takes more time, right? When, you know, what happens if you get a different answer, right? So like, oh, okay, now I have two different answers. What's the story here? As a scientist, that's great because you say, okay, I have uncertainty. It's good to know this uncertainty, right? As a practical, selfish thing, it's like, oh, now what do I write in that thesis, right? And so there's that practical thing. But I mean, our whole goal is to get at the truth. And so it's good knowing that. Good. What else have people done want to do? Rachel, what are you going to do? Um, I'm going to use one of the basis methods. I've already used Yeah, so I mean, most monoplot genetics people using nucleotides use likelihood and Bayes. Okay. Um, one issue is as you as you scale up, we talked about you know the Bayesian hat store example. You know, searching over that space becomes harder and harder as the number of taxa goes up. 
because at that point people start using likelihood because you just can't sample it well enough with Bayesian approaches. Right? So if you're doing 500 taxa, you can do both. If you're doing 5,000 taxa, probably likely don't. If you get a tree with 40,000 taxa, you use likelihood. Right? Um, you can also do parsimony at that scale. Good. What other folks want to do? I guess my thought would be that hopefully whatever relatedness tree I find, someone else has contributed. <laughs> um, right. And hopefully they've used different methods so that I have a pretty sure idea of what, what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I personally, from my own research, don't see myself building trees from the ground up because um, I want to build the new genetic stuff. So I don't yeah. have the data to do it. Yeah. yeah. And that's worthwhile thinking. If you think, if you talk about all the different things like which model are you going to use? Have you searched long enough? Have you searched the space well enough? Right? Doing this is really hard, right? Um, and so uh, you should have, but in the course, you should be able to know how to do it, right? You should be able to know, was it done well, right? What you do yourself is up to you know, what, what's available to you. Yeah, and definitely, that's why I taught you the how to steal trees first, right? Because oftentimes, you have the world's expert in your group who has built a tree. You can say, okay, why well, wouldn't this built this last week? Oh, I built my own tree. Probably better go with the expert with you. But you're reading papers and say, oh, they just did a a neighbor joining tree, they didn't think about consistency or anything, go build a, go build a tree yourself. Good. All right. Other folks will all volunteer. So one cool thing now, only in the past 15 years, is that you can use all these methods for all kinds of data. Right? Until the Lewis paper, you could in theory use, use likelihood for these other models, for like morphology, no one actually did. But even today, Many people, for a morphological data, will only use parsimony, right? But there have been papers, uh, there was a Wright and Hill's paper recently that showed that you know, Bayesian approaches work better for morphology than with parsimony. That's how you can still do both. All right, cool. So any questions about any of this? Pre-building, tree inference, uncertainty? Oh, one thing I should have mentioned. So we, we use this Bayesian approach to get this uncertainty, or we use blue to get uncertainty. How do we show it? How do we communicate that uncertainty? Like how do we write it on the tree? Yeah. Like, you know, or, yeah. How, yeah. How do you write it on the tree or how do you communicate it? It's good. Uh, usually, I've written it on different words. Either multiple ones, like each address, or multiple ones, or like randomly mm -hmm. And We haven't talked about Bremer, but not many people use Bremer, so Bremer. Yeah. Um, all right, so you're writing on the nodes, but what are you writing? So if you, if you see any published tree, you'll see something like this. We'll have a tree, and they'll have numbers. 30, well, we don't want 30. We'll have 80, 75, 100. OK? So what do those numbers mean? Right. So what's it, is it, is it better to be big or small? Okay, and what's the maximum? 100. Or if you're doing a posterior, I'll often do that on a scale of 0 to 1. The same thing, right? 100 watts. Yeah? Well, if you run like a tree based on likelihood and then you did 100 trees throughout, it's like. Like relationship. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. So what we actually get from doing bootstrapping or from Bayesian approaches is not this tree with numbers on it. We just get a bunch of trees. Right? So we're talking about bootstrapping, you do 50 bootstrap replicates, you get out 50 trees, right? Those 50 slow, slow analyses we talked about. Right? And so I have you know A, B, C, D. I have the other one. I have A, C, D, D. I also then get you know, A, C, D, D again, right? So if I get, you know, this tree twice, this tree once, right? And I can imagine a whole set of trees, right? And what I do then is summarize them, right? So I do this to get sort of an average tree. And so I say, okay, I found, you know, A and B only once. So I say, okay, that's A, B versus C, D. I found that one time. 
AC versus BD. I've done that two times. Okay, so just this, this we call a split, right? Where you say you know, I have this separated from everything else. Um, and how many times do you have that? You can do it in sort of an average tree, what we call a consensus tree, right? Where you find find some tree that agrees with as many of these splits as possible. Okay. Once you have that tree, then they can say, okay, how often do I have this to be separate from everything else? Right. So this is by partition statement. Right. I have A and B on this side, C, D, E, and F on this side. Right. Then how often do I have C and D on one side and everything else on the other side? Okay. And so these are ways of summarizing it such that these numbers mean support for this split. Okay. Now one thing people are often sloppy about, they think about this as support for a node. Okay. You've probably heard that. There's not support for a node. A node is this thing here, so back to the tree terminology thing on the YouTube video. Right? Here's the node. We're not saying how can we find this three-way split. We're saying how can we find this two-way split. Okay, so actually, the way we summarize these numbers are supports on branches, not nodes. Okay, now you can imagine doing it such as on nodes. No one does that, right? The sort of thing where you can think about later on, we're talking about how to develop new methods, right? Something as simple as summarizing nodes rather than edges would be a new method in the field. You could publish that as a thing, right? And it could perhaps have importance, right? So if what you really care about is how does this work when you have multiple things combining, maybe that's what you want to show. So it's pretty easy how like just take a little bit and you get all this, you know, a new method. Right? This field's still pretty young. Okay. So with both with both Bootstrap and Bayesian, what we're doing is taking all these different trees and summarizing them. Okay. <coughs> and this can lead to artifacts, right? So if I have, you know, this text on F, sometimes it's here and sometimes it's here. Depending on these two things, so I only get two trees out, one with F here, one with F here. Right? This affects support everywhere else. Because I don't have, I no longer have a, you know, EF or there's no split. I only have that half the time. I only have an AB split half the time. It's even though all the tree but F is the same tree, but I have 100% support for that. Because of how I summarize it, it feels like I have bad support everywhere. Okay. And so as you get bigger and bigger data sets, you know, you have, you have a tree of 5,000 species. One taxon that hops around like that can make everything look horrible. Okay. So what would you do in that case? Throw the rogue out. Throw the rogue out, right? So the jargon is that's the rogue taxon, right? That's the rogue one. Um, <coughs> and you can throw it out. Now, the problem is it's hard to see because when you, oftentimes you don't see these raw trees, you just see the summary. So you don't know which one's the rogue one. So in the past five years, we've developed techniques to find the rogue ones, right? Um, so algorithmically, right? Because that can be helpful. So there's ways of getting summary of the trees that have only a subset of taxa. So that can be useful. And that can happen, doesn't that always happen with big trees, it can happen with you know, a tree of 10 taxa, you still have a single row of taxa on that messes everything up. Just be, but just because of how we summarize it. Okay. Um, so that's why another reason to have different summaries, summary of these approaches. Okay. And it's always worth thinking about what underlies these actual numbers you see. Okay. Now there are rules of thumb for these numbers, right? So you want to see this, what's, what's a good bootstrap support number? Let's sort of see. Of 80, so 70 or 80. And that's based on one paper by Hillis and Bull. It's one simulation, right? In Bayesian, 95, right? Uh, 99. And, they, and because they're, they're measuring different things, right? So bootstrapping, you're doing the same thing with replacement, right? So if I, had, if I made up a new data set, what would I get? With Bayesian, I always have the same data set every time, right? I'm just moving across that space. So they're measuring different things. Now you could do a combined thing. You do bootstrapping plus Bayesian approaches. No one does that yet, because it'd be horribly slow, right? But that'd be another new thing, right? We say, you know, what's the possibility of probability given the uncertainty in the in the data set, right? And do that. Any questions? All right, so take a two-minute break, and then we can get our, start actually running things. So think about, you know, what kind of person are you? Do you want to do light skin first? Do you want to do Bayesian first, right? Um, and then start digging into these tutorials, right? and I'll walk around and help you, and you know, pair up if you want to to go through the tutorial. And just so you know the feel, and so RaxML has been around for a few years, and it keeps, keeps getting better and better. It's a very fast likelihood search program, it assumes likelihood. Um, Beast is used a lot for dating. Okay. So if you want to figure out how old a group is, 
we use B since of external constraints. Like I say, I have a fossil from this point. Okay. Um, we can use that. And we also use a lot for virus evolution. So we want to have a model for like you know flu virus spread, you can use beasts for that. And then Red Bay is a new model, a new new program that has a whole bunch of different approaches built into it. So we can do tree inference, but also do lots of different sorcation analyses and things like that. So like the alternative to our, the whole R ecosystem we talked about is this new approach. Okay, so we can use that too. And they all have really good tutorials written for them. And so you can choose one you want to try out first and start going through it. Right, so take a couple minute break and then come back and start working. Assume you have you assume you're using this whole set of models rather than single individual models. You can draw this data. But just how the how the data is going to be working with this help you work with science and the main research that you're doing. So then what do you think that's going to be doing with that? Say it's in division one or two, and it's going to be what you do. So I have a really lean response to this, which is one that probably won't be, but I can just say I put if I do this. Yeah. 
questions that you have in terms of access to the information that you provide on your website. So you want to make sure you it. So you've installed it on your own computer, and that's what's good for you. Um, but in real life, you need to run these stuff across it because NP hard problems are hard for a long time. And so we have problems on campus, but also they have this cyber discovery environment that NSF pays for at the moment. Um, and you can upload your, your samples, your, your data there and run it there. And so no kind of thing, like, oh, your run's done. And it's actually pretty pointless. You'll need a free login. So one question is, and this will come up whenever you're installing software. Right, so how does these commands, you know, make, and so what does make do? Make something, good. <laughs> so make's an awesome program. And what it does is, if you look at this make file, if you don't want to look at the make file, it has a whole series of instructions, okay? And so to go from basic text computer code to an actual functioning program, you have to compile it, so you convert it into computer code. Okay, and it's a long process. It can take um, you know hours for huge programs, right? And what Make does is it lets you build things gradually, and that way, if you change only part of the code, it can still use all the previous stuff and just modify what's changed. Um, and so it's handy. So actually, you, people can use it for reproducible data flows too. So if you're doing an analysis, for example, I did analysis of um, the 500 species looking at rates of evolution, and we try to change a character matrix at one point. You know, what you could do is have your entire process of build the tree, run the model, analyze the tree, right? And if you just, if you just change one part of it, it would only run that one part that's changed. You can do that way. And so that's what this make thing is doing. Um, and then remove, so when you're compiling code, like C or C++ code, it creates these object files, these compiled files on the way to making the whole thing. And if they're clever, they would make your, their files so that automatically gets rid of that Cruft you don't need, right? They haven't. And so you have all these extra files that take up space, which you can remove those. So that's that. Yeah. Um, other questions about that? Do you see anything when you're compiling Red Bays or compiling other things like that? Slash dot dot, it's two, two. results. Okay. Yeah. 
So, so it's a particular small group, you know, help, like help would be a better job. Okay, so it's a group of five people. Thank you. 
but it's fine. It's fine. Sigma is sort of an uh, older approach for doing this sort of thing. It's basically like running a, almost like a lightweight virtual machine. Okay. It's not bad. It's just. What was the other option? Um, so they should have uh, the Raxmel didn't execute what we know. So it means already binary, already compiled into code that the user can run. Okay. So if you go to the GitHub site. Yeah. So when does this execute? Um, do you know if you have any of these? So oftentimes they have like a bleeding edge build that has a few of these not tested well. Okay. So just give it a minute. If I download all of it, should this be in my folder yeah. somewhere? Yeah. So if I'm in my terminal, I can run it like this. Yeah, so CD standard rational master. Uh, no, no. Uh, well, there are two of them. <laughs> there you go. We would use this. Do you want my bad names? You got the same. Yeah. Right. So 
So, so when, which step did that get me to? <laughs> so when you're running, so oftentimes you're running command line programs like RaxML, um, Red Bays, things like that, you have to, have to give it commands. And you give it commands through, um, when you, so when you call the programs, like call RaxML HPC, or on Windows, like call RaxML HPC.exe, or on you know, Mac, you get past the path, dot slash RaxML HPC, whatever. Then you have to give it commands afterwards, right? In the same way, if I were, um, let me show you. Right? If I do ls, it does something. If I do ls dash one, it gives it a different format. Rather than passing an argument to ls, right, that says, you know, take this and give it a one, one line. If I do cd, it goes up a level. If I do um, move, let me see what's here. If I do move bad.pdf, it'll give me an error, right? Because I didn't give it all enough commands. I have to move something to somewhere. So I can do move bad.pdf to worst.pdf, and that's worked, right? So same thing with RaxML. You just call RaxML, it's like, yeah, I don't know what to do. Do you want me to run some data or what, right? And so what you have to do is say, RaxML, I want to run this model, right? And you can, the manual will tell you which kind of mod models there are. Um, random seed, which we'll get back to, right? Um, the output name, and then other commands, and so the T, I forget what the T1 is. Okay. Um, this random seed is because computers don't do random very well. Right? So we think about, if I ask you to pick a random number, right? You could probably figure out 17. 17 again, or 42 or something, right? Um, or you could say, okay, let me base it on my current pulse or the temperature outside or something like that, right? The computer has lots of trouble picking random numbers. Um, <coughs> and so sometimes they'll initiate them by like the, the clock time, right? So like take the current time and divide by 17 and add three, and that's your random number, right? Which works fine when you're starting three things at the same time. So by doing you know bootstrapping and say okay, pick 100 random bootstrap samples and run them. Okay, I'll pick 100 random things, but use the same same time for everything. Then I pick the same one 100 times, right? So I'm not getting a good, good random sample. With RaxML, the order which starts building the tree is a random order. Right? So we'll try taking three taxa, add a fourth, add a fifth, add a sixth, and build up the tree that way. Okay. And <coughs> it needs to have a random seed to do that. And so you can just, so some programs will have a default random seed. This one you have to tell it what the random seed is. Okay. But that's, that, that, that's, that's about. And so if you look at RaxML manual, it'll tell you all, what the, all different commands mean. Right? So you know, this command means do 20 random searches, right, and so forth. And so it has all, and so you often find this in programs in this field where the arguments come in through a, a bunch of arguments to you give it when you run the when you run the program. Does that make sense? Okay, cool.
Dr. Miller. So info, um, MPI has multiple cores so, uh, so computer has twice, yeah. yeah. it's much better. Okay. Um, it's I'm trying to figure out how to get this data set. It won't work well on Mac and stuff, so let's try it through the um, So it says, um, on, it's, it's a new language of data sets, but when I open it, it just says that. Like, Okay, so what did you give me? Like, what is the path of the Windows executable that I'm using? Yeah, so the path okay. put it in the same directory, or put MaxML in whatever the code name is that they use. So it's, uh, I am not sure what program that is. So okay. I can look that right. other program. Yeah, so it's just the same directory. Yeah. So I, I eventually ended up finding a that way to set the path through the command, but like the trying to set the path through my computer, it would remember it for like a couple of runs, and then like I would go to something else and come back and go, and we could figure out why we were doing that. Yeah, <laughs> cool. Yeah. By the way, now that you've all been compiling MaxML, you can now get this joke, right? So ongoing learning objective of understanding XKCD cartoons. Right? You know what that means. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, so, so, with Drexel, it does the first argument search, and then like, it's 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 like, it's
The one that we haven't talked about yet is model choice. Right? So if you're using that for XML or using um, graph bays, whatever, you choose which kind of model you want to do. Right? So the model has sigma is factor around zeros and ones, a's and b's. Right? Just choose a equals b or a is different than b. Right? There's a whole school of how you do this, but we'll cover that in a few weeks. But for right now, you just choose a single model. Using like base factors, which we're interested in the paper, or a key gate information criterion, uh, we'll just choose some type of model. Yeah. Um, or also on the other one. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, but I don't know how to make it look like tree, but I got the oh boss spot. Uh -huh. That's so exciting. Yeah. Something popped up. As they call it, it's like that. Oh, hey, something worked. Um, cool. So I um, by, by the way. So those are all grad students and you two are undergrads, so you might want to make sure you don't have that. Yeah, that's just don't forget. Okay. <laughs> so I compiled it. Yeah. And I'm not really sure. So I, I made a folder in the last week folder, which is called data. I don't know if that's right. I'm not sure yeah. where it's all the notes are in. Uh, so I don't really know what to do with my okay. last time. <laughs> so this is eight um, I have personal data, but it doesn't spell my area. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I know that. So what are you trying to do? Are you trying to build it? I was just trying to go. So I like a red base should be. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 So technically, then I can get rid of this box tree and still use this. Yeah, it might be the one to the 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 Often the paper will have a region file and that's where the data is stored. Yeah. 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 Yeah
So, so one thing about parsimony that's interesting is you often find the same many trees that have the same parsimony support. And so you're going to recommend they'll give you a bunch of trees or a couple of different trees. So you get a thousand trees with parsimony support. Um, it's actually theoretically possible with likelihood too. There's actually a whole area of work on um, terraces, something that's a whole area that has to do with it. Um, so like Anderson in this field is looking at this thing. Um, it can also be also be also too. And it's it So, in the real practical path, then, right? 
Yes, so where do you ask them out? In my folder. Like the main folder is this. Right. So you then you call it. Yeah, so two things can be helpful um, if you're using command line stuff. Yeah. Well, three things. So if you do up arrow, it gives you the previous command. Up arrow again gives the command before that. Up arrow. So you can scroll through and then you can modify them. LS, you know, and run it. You also do something called history. And it'll give you all the commands you typed in. Right? And so I could just do, you know, exclamation point 504, and it will just run command 504 for me. So that's handy as well. Um, and also there's tab completion, right? So I can do like um, ls, you know, documents, and rather than having to type out documents, I can type doc and then tab, and it'll complete, it'll complete it for me. Right. Or if, it, I, if I just go to D and then type tab multiple times, it'll eventually say, oh, you want documents or downloads? Documents. So that saves a lot of typing, too. Oh, nice. Yeah. And it's underneath me with that cartoon about compiling. Yeah. Okay. Now, can I delete, as I've been really letting myself, like, now I have all of these up in my yep. folder. Can I delete them as I go and give myself the best way to delete them? No problem. You can delete them. That's fine. And that's all the way. You should at least look at a file name because that would change your temp form. Well, a useful thing is if you are using R for most of your stuff, um, rather than trying to remember your commands you type in, you can have R do it for you. So if I'm doing RaxML, I could just type, oh, sorry, yeah, system RaxML dash P1234. Um, you know, dash model, GTR, you know, tree dot phi or whatever. And then I could uh, run this it's with an R. And so R will actually run this code on your computer. And you can also use exec if you want on, on a PC. And that way, I'm trying to remember, okay, what did I use? What was my C? What model did I use? You can just store a bunch of these commands. Um, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and then GTR gamma, and so you can know what that did each step. Okay, there's other ways to do this too, but if you're already in the R ecosystem, this is an easy way of doing it. And of course, you can also do what we talked about last time, R markdown. You do as R markdown stuff too. So you could have um, uh, here it is. Right, something like that. And then you can so run. 
and in general doing doing things where you have like everything saved and clean what what commands you did makes your life a lot easier, right? Because that way you're running methods, you can say, oh, what I did was that GTR, GTR, gamma. Oh, I can just look at that, right? If you're then writing the paper, you can, you can include that information in the paper, and then someone else can replicate your analyses. Um, it, and the visibility is better. And so just to get, in the, get into that habit. We'll talk more about this as we go. No, I mean, how do you think you can read that way, right? Right. Okay. Because we should be able to read it. Okay. Well, you can read it structured like this. Mm -hmm. You can read between uh, which entry and which entry. Yeah. <laughs> right? And then we can get more and more cool, except for some chicken things. Yeah, so the chickens are they're on the off, too. Yeah. I mean, I just. I their data so I could also just see their, their example data like this. Yep. <laughs> and hopefully when you do push up you can find where they report from this trade. Okay. Right? That's the hope. Otherwise you're a scientist. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and then 
Which one are you trying to run? I'm just curious, which one are you trying to run? 
All the stuff into one. On a file system. Okay. And so those are the trees are your files. Okay. And so you can go to your files and pull those. R is J so you can do those programs. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so don't double click okay. on stuff. You have to go into R. Go into R, R and then R okay. V dot you know, or V dot tree files. No, well, I had a problem when I did that. Ah, so this stuff's all additive? It doesn't make it. But I installed it manually. Does that not do anything? Where are you just installed? If you didn't install it manually correctly, it doesn't fine. Okay. So how did you install it? I mean, I just downloaded it since I just installed it. Install it for the computer program, or you just install it? I mean, Apple Yeah, so it's not, so no. if I do, 
application is now Uh, maybe I, yeah, I pressed return and I was like, oh, okay, I figured. Maybe you're trying to play something that you just did that way. I'll do master and play that. I'm not sure. Yeah. No, I'm not And then I can just do this again? Yeah. After yeah. I change well, do, directory? Well, do this first. Okay. Just the well, actually, I'll do this one. Um, you should probably just go on and try to apply to the password and then come back. Okay. It's taking a very long time. There we go. All right, let's try all this. There's an expression in the field, RTFM, which read the, pick your effort of choice, manual. <laughs> um, so you can read the fine manual, and so people will tell you that, right? So, like with RaxML, like with the tutorials, they also work going through the manual and seeing what it does. It's like that. You read the fine manual. You can buy t-shirts. Did you figure out how to get, so my, on my Windows, it says it's missing. Yeah, we didn't get it. Okay, so I'm just not going to worry too much about it. Is there anything you can save? Uh, you can go back and see what you did in there. Yeah. Export history. So you could do. I mean, I, mean, I know I have, it's going to be really long, but I guess I figure at least if I really want it, then I can go back and look through it. So here, I'm, so I'm doing history, mm -hmm. redirecting it to history.text, okay. and then I can, you know. And I'll just put it in the directory. And if you, and I could put it somewhere else if I wanted. I could do history. I could do it at you know <laughs> desktop and just pass the path and it saves it there. Uh, so on Windows, the, the way you do paths is different. You have colons and stuff. Right. It didn't like the word history. It said history is not an in internal RC. Uh, so yeah. So Linux and Mac have a whole set of commands that Windows doesn't. Yeah. Is it something like tier versus? Right. Yeah, I can try looking. For some reason, the Windows when you Google search up the Windows help is so not helpful because all it wants to do is use like the user interface, and I was like, click here, and I'm like, that I just want the commands. Right. <laughs> so I've, I've been happy. You've outgrown, you've outgrown the help. Because yeah. <laughs> it's, it's always like click on this and then find that, and I'm like, that's not at all what I wanted to do. But <laughs> all right, I will check. My last reader was related to check on this. Yeah, it works fine. There's a image limit. You can make text in there. But you can make text in a set of vectors.
Oh, so under the files thing in the lower right, uh, the little um, more thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, so you s oh, go to working directory. Let's see. No, you can, just set, you can just set as. Let's see. Oh. Um, Don't use Windows. Oh, it's under tools. Tools. No, it's not. Okay, cool. Okay. Figure out how to save the history. But now I just need to figure out how to move the history from one file to one. Okay, so on the next app, Let's go up like the Windows file browser and just copy and paste the file. Oh, easier. So in Windows, it's um, you have just this is kind of odd, but you have to like yeah. That, really? That dusty command apparently it does things like that. Oh, like yeah. lets dusty lets you and ask more than just what you can do. And the ace history spells that well. Oh. It worked. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it helped me get the history. It's so try. Oh, it was me history. I'll keep it. <laughs> Why did that work, do you think? I it did, because it, it, it saved it right well, there. That's impressive. So unless it was just like, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Well, I'll, I'll open it, and then it'll be like, oh, no, it did not work. Because okay. it says definition. Uh, so let me give it the proper way to say this. <laughs> But it's interesting to know that this is tight. So compile. I have your definition. Awesome. But I don't understand how to. I don't right. know why it won't work. So it said to do this, right? Yeah. To execute the binary, but. But there's the not test on the test. So that seems not like a better way to pass. Yeah. But that is fine. Yeah. So. <laughs> It just gives you the yep. command. It doesn't give you. So there's in your path, 
Scores. Oh, I mean, so the scores are the rates. Final gamma base score, that's true. That's, is that a measure? Yeah. 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 It's completely separate. It's like the prime R. It's not like an R add in. Okay. Yeah. I find that there's normally when you're doing an R base, it's right. If you're really tiny tree, actually, you can get actually get a prime R. Yeah. The one thing I often do with R Studio and R is turn off the autocomplete thing. Sometimes it'll be like, oh, I'll wipe the bunch of FOIs and delete all the R references and so on. So my fix is a little bit too much. Um, I don't have to understand what the not turn off, so I'll turn it off, but then I'll use the Yeah. Cool. Um, if you've created a tree using a page document, can't you create a post to have that post on all the same trees? Do you have to like do it somehow? Uh, you can run into it. Okay. There's ways to do it. Um, uh, I'm not sure what, what could be a way. Often I'll do a tree and then you have a tree and then you can get the work that way. But okay. I like doing it through a different way. So I'll do some stuff like where you say it mm -hmm. and then do that. Um, big trees might have it easier. Yeah. Uh, but is there a way to even just do this? Not like, like yeah, visualize yeah. it, but just like as a. Yeah, there are. I'm not sure. It, it's Tavern might have it. Okay. Just there. Just like, yeah. yeah, one way to do that when you do involve the UX tree format is to have a good way of replicating stuff. Okay. Because otherwise, it has to be replicated. Because it's 
So I'm sure it's in that documentation somewhere, and I bet that's why they're saying you can sell it. Or, right. Yeah. So you can you know, probably shouldn't shoot them once and then get it half again. <laughs> Looking? Yeah, just reading data is problematic. So it's just because I'm not specifying the stock anymore correctly. Okay. But right now, like it gave us as an example. Yeah, it is under data, but data is under validation. So where are you now? Well, I, I executed the rentals. Right. So that's all oh, I know. Okay, let's quit. But so and let's see where we are. So correct working directory. So it's in there. Okay. And it says the data is mine. So where's, right. the, where's data? Where's the so validation? Right, it's the validation. So you have to change directory outside of red phase? You could do it within red phase, and you could put path up and then back down. Okay. Or the absolute path. Oh, so it's not really great either. Okay, so now we are in red phase. Yeah, so I mean, so you can, you can call other programs from within R, right? So the package is written to do that. So the ifs package can call RapML, can call Mr. Bayes from within R, and you can call math and a lot of different programs, and bring stuff back into R. So it's one way of doing it. The hitch is you have to install rates or math or RapML properly to start with. So if you do that, then. I just, I would think it's really difficult to keep up my issue with math. If you don't want to get a root reply, read this manual first. Read the standard textbook about phylogenetics. If you haven't read one, you shouldn't be using this program. Yes. Find your guide. And don't send the guy emails. Oh, yeah. Well, okay, so let me close up the screen so people watching online can see what's going on. Um, Is that in the tutorial? Is that, that's in the. It was in the tutorial, and then you can, where you download it from the repository, there's a, so at the very top, there's a get the, the
repository, uh -huh. and then you can get the manual from there. That's how I did it at least. Yeah. Yeah, I used the PDF. I just thought it was really funny. <laughs> yeah. More pages, yes. So this at the very end? No, this is at the very beginning. Oh. It was getting, I was reading through it. It was like getting help. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So never send emails. So if you develop software, um, users don't read the manual. So like RTFM is because people don't read the fine manual that you've written, <laughs> right? And you get the same questions every time. Like, like all of you run into issues like, it's not in my path. I'm like, well, learn how to put it in your path. Right, and if you get thousands of people emailing you, it's not my path. Like, well, learn how to do it, um, and so that's why. Right. Um, now that said, a lot of these groups have like a lot of programs like have user groups, right? So there's a RevBase user group you can look at. That one seems to have one too. That Google Docs. Okay. Um, and you can see, and one thing you can do actually is look to see how active these groups are. Right, um, because if it's you know people go months without answering, then it tells you something. Right, this is pretty active. Um, for R, for code in R in Pagenex, there's an R Sig Philo. So Sig is special interest group. So R special interest group for phylogenetics, and that's actually awesome because you can go there and ask a question, and you'll get the authors of the program responding. You'll also get like Jill Felsenstein saying, "Oh, that's stupid. And this is how you should do it better," or something like that. It's really helpful. Um, yeah. And so that's worth doing too. But again, if it's just like, you know, a simple question that you should just read the manual and know how to do, you know, like, how do I plot a phylo phylogeny? Plot, you know, <laughs> people get annoyed after a while. That's why. Have you ever met Alexis? Yeah, he's great. You know, he's a very friendly guy and he's, he's awesome. Yeah, I had a couple interactions with him. He was in Munich at the same time. I put my own work to deliver to people. <laughs> I'm sure you're going well then. I mean, like supporting users is not, is not the fun part. I mean, having people use your stuff is cool, but like answering the same question all the time is not. Follow the tutorial that wasn't like right. <laughs> original words, but and one thing that only like, like, you just copy and paste not know what you're doing, right. rather than they now modify a subset. These don't change quickly enough. Yeah. 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 Before we break, any other questions that have come up now that you've been 
messing with the stuff for a while, anything that was in the papers that doesn't make sense anymore or that you care about more or something like that? Have you ever tried using um, Cybers? Yes. It could be worth doing if, if, if you know, there you don't worry about it. Can't shut off my laptop. Like I'm actually thinking of putting all the stuff for our course, like all the R packages, as an instance on Cybers at some point. But I haven't done that yet. Because one thing I should have noted is that when you see likelihoods, there are weird numbers like negative 500, right? And that's a very weird probability. The probability of this is negative 500. And what it actually is is the log right here. Right? It's like the log of 500. And so you could do EXP, the likelihood, and get back to the probability space. But if it's a number smaller than 1, 2, 3, could be a 308. So class is officially done. I'm going to keep churning away at this. Um, if you have questions, you can ping me on Gitter.
If you want, you can try, and those of you who tried Vraxamel, you can try running RevBase or Beast. We'll come back to those later when we start talking about uh, 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 dating trees. <laughs>